Welcome to Story Matters. I'm Jeff Krakoff. I'm here with Heidi Ondek, who is Executive Director and Superintendent at the Western Pennsylvania School for Blind Children. Uh, Heidi, thanks for joining us today. Um, why don't you first just tell us a, a little bit about your background. Uh, where'd you start your career and, and where have you been prior to your, your current spot? Sure, thank you, Jeff. I started my career about 35 years ago in El Paso, Texas as a special education teacher. And I found my way back to Western Pennsylvania a few years later where I continued my career in a variety of capacities, uh, serving as director of pupil services, elementary principal, and most recently as high school principal, then assistant superintendent, superintendent at the Quaker Valley School District until about 18 months ago when I joined the Western Pennsylvania School for Blind Children. Got it. So, so I know that your school is one of the oldest, uh, one of the largest, and one of the best schools that, uh, that help uh, people with visual impairment, with blindness. Tell me a little bit more about your school's mission and the, uh, the students that you serve. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, the school has a long and rich tradition of serving individuals with special needs, uh, specifically with blindness or visual impairment. Um, but over the past 130 years, what has remained constant is the school's mission around responding to the ever-changing needs of our school community and our region um, in serving individuals with blindness and visual impairment. Our population today um, educates uh, 200 children on our day school campus uh, and an additional 200 in outreach programs in schools across Western Pennsylvania. We also have an uh, early um, childhood program that is a Keystone STARS accredited child care center and uh, an adult program for students who graduate post age 21 adult services. Okay, so you mentioned responding to the needs, right? I think everybody in the world has to respond to the coronavirus right now. Right. dealing with things in a lot of different ways. I do know that your students, are, are, they tend to be more at risk from a health standpoint. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and what are some of the things that you've been doing to, uh, to change because of COVID-19? Right, well, our school is um, one that attracts uh, really good people, special educators who are just wired to serve children with disabilities and what we like to say, uh, children with unique abilities. Um, most of our children, a fair number of them, have other challenges. Uh, many of them are um, medical challenges and health conditions that um, do put them at risk for illness more so than typically developing children. So our staff has, um, has rallied in the absence of the day-to-day -day school routine to serve not only the children's needs and their families' needs, but some of the needs of our broader community. Yeah. So what are some specific examples? I know you made a decision very early, like a lot of schools for the safety and well-being, have to close the physical school. Um, how's that affected your students, your staff? Well, we're disconnected um, in ways uh, that, that do impact us. And we've, um, I think the staff, the families have, have um, done an amazing job of um, making the best of the circumstances and in some ways finding some really unique opportunities that didn't exist before. But doing school remotely for um, our population is quite a challenge and we're learning every day new and better ways of meeting those needs. Um, but we really miss being together and that's been probably the biggest um, sort of struggle with this, this situation, uh, uh, the pandemic, is um, that our desire to be together has been thwarted by um, uh, necessity uh, in combating the virus. Is the stay-at-home orders really pr preclude us from coming together as people. Right. Now, I, I hear stories, some very good, feel-good stories coming out of such an awful situation. I know when the decision was made to close, there, there, was, there was food on the campus that, that you were able to do something with. I know that there's been some examples of being able to get out and, and get food to some of the families you serve. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, like all of our schools in, in the region and beyond, uh, 
there, there have been some, just some beautiful stories that have unfolded. And we had some perishable food, for instance, uh, that, that was going to go to waste. Uh, who of us knew we would be closing school um, a month earlier when food was ordered, which is typically the case in schools. And our, our food service directors um, rallied and made sure that that food was donated um, to our region's um, food banks. And they were very, very much um, appreciative of that. Um, the, the other foods that um, staff was able to deliver were some specialty foods that are difficult and costly for some families to obtain, some, some um, thickened products and some other more hospital grade food products that are difficult for families to get. So um, I'm really proud of my team for, for uh, rallying around that need and finding safe ways with masks and gloves to uh, collect those items from the school loading dock and get them safely to the homes of our children. It's funny you, you mentioned masks and gloves. I understand there's something else going on as recently as this, this weekend, the past couple of days, where you're able to help supply uh, much needed masks. T tell me what's going on there. Right, another example of you know, leaders just stepping up from within the organization um, Molly Eads, an equipment technologist um, with our staff, uh, alerted Mark Kislin, one of our occupational therapists, that there was a gentleman by the name of Tom Joseph in the Pittsburgh area who is um, part of this Make a Mask movement, and um, he's the local coordinator. And what people are doing, uh, I believe this started in Billings, Montana, is using 3D printers to create uh, masks that have a filter center that can be interchanged. And, um, and these masks can be used multiple times, I believe up to 10 or 12 times over safely by, by healthcare providers. So we all know we're facing a, math, a mask shortage and we're feeling a bit helpless and disconnected. This was a way we could move five of our 3D printers out of our school. They're currently being um, unutilized and, and sitting in an empty school building, get them into the homes of several volunteer staff members who with their family members are going to be able to produce uh, a good many masks over the course of the next several weeks. Um, not a lot, um, maybe about 50, 60 a week, uh, but we think um, every little bit helps and we hope to inspire uh, some other school districts and, and agencies to do the same. I've already gotten some calls this morning from a few superintendents who are wanting to, um, to participate with us. That's awesome. Yeah, every little bit helps, especially as you said, they're reusable. Um, but by changing the filter. So how did that idea come about? Like, what do you normally use the 3D printers for in the school? And, and how did this whole idea evolve? So you're familiar with the STEAM movement in other schools. We too in our school have a technology lab and we have students and staff who have access to these printers for various projects. Uh, our staff is a very creative staff by necessity. When a problem exists for a student, um, oftentimes it, it's a staff member who, who invents a solution. Uh, an example is our horticulture therapist um, uh, is, um, is quite accustomed to cr sol solving problems using the 3D printer and she created a product I call a donut that is a plastic uh, donut shaped circle that placed on, uh, on the surface of a uh, pot um, can help guide a child's hand to the center or that donut hole to plant a seed. And she envisioned this, had been making them out of, I think, cardboard and then transitioned into these plastic pieces that are very useful and really enable kids to access the kind of learning that their, their non-disabled peers experience pretty routinely in, in public schools. That's great, that's great. So two final questions. They have nothing to do with uh, what you do on your day job and weekend and night job, I'm sure. Um, tell me, t if you weren't an educator, if you weren't a superintendent, um, what other career path may you have taken? I, I just always wanted to be a special ed teacher. I did toy at one time uh, with being an art teacher but my love for working with children with disabilities surpassed that. So I, I'd like to say I, I put a creative bent on the work I've done, uh, but I, I cannot imagine being anything but an educator. I absolutely love what I do. Is there anything else as, as, in your younger years that you thought I might want to do something? Is there any other passion that you have that may have taken you down a different road? 
but I always wanted to get my pilot's license actually. <laughs> And, and now that seems like a completely impractical goal. My, my, my kids like to tease me that when I retire, I'll be, I'll be the one that flies the, the planes up and down the, the coastline at the beach with the banners advertising for local restaurants. But uh, who knows, maybe one day I'll do that. But I, I, can't, I cannot imagine doing anything but maybe some sidelines, um, but nothing but what I've chosen as my career. It's my passion, it's been my life. That's interesting. So last question. <laughs> Tell us something about yourself that uh, people that know you might be surprised to know. This is my favorite story because people who know me well would never guess this. I tend to be rather passive, I guess, in personality, laid back, low key. I, you know, I'm, I, I practice yoga. And, and so I, one of the other things I've loved in my career is being a chaperone for student trips abroad. Some of them have been service learning trips. They've all been just... Um, really incredible experiences to, to do what I love, which is travel, and to enjoy that with kids, many of whom had never left the country before. Um, language immersion, cultural immersion, service is just all good stuff. So on one particular trip, we were in Paris and uh, with 16 teenagers and French teacher and a French tour guide named Anique, who was about five feet tall. And she repeatedly warned us about pickpocketers, as she called them, pickpocketers. And um, lo and behold, we get on a very crowded subway in Paris with 16 kids, and I'm counting to make sure that they're all where they should be. And uh, I had been the victim of theft. And as I looked down my purse, my money is gone. So when I looked around, it was just the 16 kids, the tour guide, the French teacher, myself, and two kind of shady looking characters. So I confronted them, and I was rather persistent, and I actually got my money back. And the kids to this day I run into who are now adults laugh about that story and they have many different versions of it. One of which is I hit them over the head with a baguette of French bread to get my money back, which is not true, but I did get my money back and it kind of is a story that um, makes me laugh and um, is one that you might not expect. Well, good, good for you. <laughs> so, uh, thanks again for joining us. Keep up the good work, everything you and your staff and, and your families are doing at the, uh, Western PA School for Blind Children. Thanks again. Thank you, Jeff. Our pleasure. Be well. You too. Be safe. Be healthy. Take care. If you or someone you know has an interesting story to share, let us know. Email us at storymatters at